Our, ne our next speaker is Hu Shuli, the founder and publisher of Kaxing Media, China's leading financial press. She has been internationally recognized for her achievements in journalism and was named one of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune in 2017. Unfortunately, Shuli was unable to join us live due to COVID-19, but she recorded this address late last week. And we'd also like to thank the Asian New Zealand Foundation for their support in making this happen. Hello, everyone. Kia ora. It's a pleasure to join the China Business Summit and talk to you today. I visited New Zealand more than 10 years ago and remain in close contact with many Kiwi friends. I've always been impressed by the many wonderful traits of its people. Energetic, down to earth, tolerant, passionate. And the, that very positive impression about New Zealand and its people is widely shared in China. The warm feelings among Chinese people when Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern visited Beijing in 2019 are still vivid. New Zealand and China had a constructive and friendly relationship. The two countries are vastly different in many, many ways. But there are also similarities. We found that how we dealt with the COVID was similar. Quite strict contact tracing, coupled with testing and swift entry controls. It's still too early to claim victory in the fight against the COVID, but Chinese people have been highly impressed by the successful measures taken by the New Zealand government, the support of the general public, the efficient communication, and the high level trust. COVID has brought dilemmas to decision makers. How long should social distancing last? Unemployment and bankruptcy is a price that has to be paid, but how much can we bear? The pandemic has exposed the strengths, weaknesses, and features of every society. There are more questions than answers about the virus. That uncertainty is also evident in the global economy, in geopolitics. The virus is largely under control in China now. And overall, the Chinese economy has proved resilient partly thanks to strict contact tracing policy. In most parts of the country, there are nearly zero COVID patients. The IMF has forecast that the global economy will shrink by 4.9% this year, but that China will grow by 1%. But the coronavirus remains a global public health crisis. And the consensus in China is that controlling virus is the dominant priority, brings tough questions for the country's economy. The turbulence in US-China relations and the rising anti-globalization and the protectionism around the world simply add to the set concerns. I want to highlight two indicators which will to some extent determine the next chapter of Chinese growth and especially worth watching by you, our friends in the business community. They are China's opening up and its attitude towards multilateral trade pacts. China watchers, as I'm sure many of you are, know that a very historic turning points in the last 40 years. The Chinese government has made a decisive announcement to drive forward the reform. At those critical moments, these announcements gathered consensus and led the direction of the country's development. Are we at one of those moments now? I think we may well be. The key is how China can use reform to push for its opening up. I believe the right way forward is a shift from using opening up to push for domestic reform to using domestic reform to push for opening. Rearranging these words symbolize how China sees the challenges of the global environment for its growth 
and its own solutions. As the coronavirus pandemic severely impacted the world economy and the business globalization further into reverse, China faces its sternest economic troubles. The harder things get economically, the greater need for reform. This year's central government work report gets right to the point, emphasizing the use of market to stabilize growth. This is also echoed in the set of recommendations unveiled in May, right before the legislature's annual national congress. The Communist Party and the State Council, China's cabinet, jointly issued those recommendations to accelerate market reform and call for expand China's openness to the outside world. China's economy is transitioning from high-speed to high-quality development. Although the transformation of this growth impetus has made some progress, it is yet to achieve a significant breakthrough. The downward pressure on growth is continuously growing. At the same moment, international support for multilateralism and globalization has taken hit, and the protectionism and the unilateralism are on the rise. The coronavirus pandemic has only exacerbated this situation. Many people pessimistically predict that even after the outbreak is over, it will be hard to recover cross-border flows of people, goods, and capital, at least in short term. Others assert that the globalization, as we know, is finished. The head of the World Trade Organization announced he was stepping down before the end of his first term a move that some have interpreted as a symbol of the predicament of the current multilateral trade system with the WTO as its core. In recent years, China's opening up to the outside world has shifted from a model based on flow of consumer goods and production values toward one based on rules and systems. The transition is especially apparent in the development of the financial sector. So faced with a wave of international decoupling, China can make its position clear and continue flying the flag for free trade. Deeper reforms will help make international trade and the investment freer and more convenient. Something that, in practical terms, serves the multilateral trade of the system. As far as the world's second largest economy, keeps using reform as the engine for further opening, the dec decoupling is unlikely to succeed. That leads to my second point. China should be more open to high standard trade packs. In the last couple of years, China has continued to deepen reform and expand its opening. Even during the coronavirus outbreak, China's decisiveness on free trade drew a lot of attention as the country pushed for financial opening and the construction of a free trade port in the southern province of Hainan, as well as fighting for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, scheduled to be signed this year. Let's take a look at bilateral ties with New Zealand as an example. Our two countries finished FTA negotiations last year. China's consumer market is expanding rapidly with strong demand for New Zealand's high quality exports, dairy, meat, seafood, fruit, you name it. COVID has further enhanced the country's reliance on e-commerce, which has a pen penetration rate as high as 80% of Chinese internet users and we can find a whole new chapter on e-commerce in the newly inked FTA. The ties with New Zealand as one example, which shows that at a time when globalization is suffering strong headwinds, now exacerbated by COVID, China should remain open, bilaterally, bilateral, regional, global. China's experience of joining the WTO shows that even when some demands look out of reach, 
they can actually be met if we really stretch ourselves. The discussions around the country joining the CPTPP is a good example. Caixin has published several editorials in recent years that argued China should be open towards high standard trade pacts such as CPTPP, a major regional trade treaty of which New Zealand was one of the first signatories. During a press conference at the National People's Congress, Premier Li Keqiang said, China holds a positive and open attitude toward joining the CPTPP. This was the first time a Chinese leader had publicly state, stated the country's position in CPTPP and it made waves in the international community. It was the right step to make. There are definitely hurdles ranging from SOE to data security, but other countries with similar social systems and at similar development stage, stages to China have already made the leap. China should once again open its arms to embrace the world and proceed with confidence. The significant progress made on its own government reform, trade zones construction, phase one of the US-China trade agreement, and the array of other trade and investment agreements that have either been signed or are under negotiation, all make the conditions for China's entry into the CPTPP more mature. New Zealand has always been a strong free trader, and China has been the largest beneficiary of the global trade system. We both know the challenges posed by globalization now faced with significantly declining fiscal revenues, break times for small and mid-sized businesses, and rising unemployment. All governments are dealing with tough trade-offs. It is tempting to turn inward. But isolation is not a solution. Among all the complex policy signals from China, if we focus on how it reforms, how it opens up, how it follows up with interest in trade packs. You and I can have a better sense of whether the Chinese economy will emerge out of the crisis stronger, more resilient, and whether it can become more integrated with the global economy. The pandemic is a tragedy. It has already claimed more than 500,000 lives and brought enormous disruption to all of us. However, some opportunities and positive changes will emerge out of it, like any period of upheaval. This may include faster digitalization, behavioral changes, and a greater focus on public health. And we need to be careful about the trade-offs, try to be systematic, and first of all, remain humble towards science. Right now, there is a lack of solidarity when the world needs it most. It's a sad fact, but we shouldn't give up. Lesson number one from COVID is, we are in this together. We all know that only together can we win the battle against this truly global disease. Only together can we bring the world economy back to the right track to make the global system function well again. And only together can we chart a course to a desirable future for all. We wish we can emerge out of the crisis sooner and stronger. Discussions among countries about travel bubbles are on the way. I hope it won't take too long before I can board a plane and visit the magnificent landscape of New Zealand again. I also hope that COVID values, pragmatism, compassion, tolerance can inspire more countries and help us raise the foundations of collaboration. Thank you all. Hu Shulai, it's been a great pleasure to have you here at the China Business Summit in Auckland uh, this morning, even if by distant Zoom meeting. Um, I really enjoyed your um, presentation. 
You've drawn, drawn parallels between the way New Zealand and China have dealt with COVID. Uh, before I pass to those um, interesting prospects that you've raised for future global uh, engagement, can I just draw you out on your own experiences and your team's experiences reporting on this awful pandemic down in Wuhan? Okay, I prefer to talk more about our teams because I am only one of them. Uh, actually, like all news organizations, we were all in and actually we ahead, acted ahead of the curve. Uh, we heard about the news uh, at the end of uh, last year, and we started to act from the mm -hmm. very beginning of that. And uh, our experience covering SARS 17 years ago came mm -hmm. into play. Actually, uh, the newsroom made several decisions immediately assignment to send a team of reporters to cover a story and uh, buying as many hazmat suits and masks as we could for them. A week later, we elevated the story from the public health desk to a topic that the entire newsroom would work in. That means about 200 people in total, coupled with our, coupled with our think tank and its research capacity. Uh, we sent seven reporters to the Wuhan, to Wuhan the place, including a deputy managing editor. Mm -hmm. Among the expansion of coverage, we took down the paywall so more readers could access information through our internet, through our website. All of this happened actually before the central government labeled the outbreak as a level two disease, and decided to work down Wuhan. We did all this. So how many challenges uh, did you face um, getting the story out, not just from an editorial perspective, but also from the health and safety of your journalists and editors on the ground? Actually, the core member, members of the Caixin team produced the most authoritative coverage of SARS 17 years ago. So mm. the experience like helped us greatly, I need to say that. So, but this time we didn't anticipate that the coronavirus would be so deadly and widespread, becoming the largest pandemic in living memory. But SARS gave us a good journalistic sense and a solid experience about covering contagious diseases. It also, to some extent, prepared society by giving people a sense that public health measures would, would look at, and that people should collaborate with even the strict measures to stop virus from spreading. Yeah. The influence is also different now for us, because 17 years ago, we had only one magazine, but now we also have a vibrant website giving coronavirus real-time coverage. We published between eight, 50 to 80 new items a day in the first quarter, most of which were virus-related. Our magazine, Caixin Weekly, ran eight cover stories from January to March and uh, numerous investigations. Caixin's research arms also produced a daily analysis about the spread of virus, its economic impact, and the global trends. You can read them in English too that at our Caixin's website. Yes, I, I read the uh, reporter's notebooks uh, in English, the podcast um, of the 76 days lockdown in Wuhan. So a very human story of your journalists. Oh, thank you so much. So your report reporters also said there is still a great deal to figure out about the cause of the virus and those early days. Um, have you gone any further to figuring that out? And, and what is your view about uh, the World Health Organization review that will look at all countries about how, how we all reacted to the virus? Actually, we're still waiting for the, for the results of all this that we haven't actually reached the final. So um, you've talked about um, being better prepared to cope for future pandemics. Um, how, do you, how do you suggest the world community goes about that? Um, actually, countries are varying culture and systems, and we say different choices in public 
health responses. I think mm -hmm. both New Zealand and China chose the quiet, strict contact tracing path, coupled with rapid testing and massive quarantine. None of the three elements are easy. Compared with New Zealand's population of 5 million, China has five mega cities with more than 10 million in population, as well as six more cities with a population bigger than 5 million. An outbreak in any of these density, densely populated mega cities is an enormous public health challenge. It was a deep learning curve in the last week of January. The city of Wuhan was able to test only 2,000 people in a day. But in June, Beijing has tested 10 million people in three weeks. Mm. And the testing is a very, testing capacity is very important. And the recent flare up in Beijing, do you feel that it's coming under control? We can't see the final victory so far, but I think it's already under control. Mm. Yeah. It's one thing that we're very careful about in our island nation to try and stop the virus coming through our borders. Uh, you've talked about how the global uh, economy is shrinking, but that China will grow by 1% or so. Um, you've also suggested that China is at an inflection point where it can look at using uh, the domestic uh, reforms to push for more opening up. Yeah. And also using the market to stabilize growth. I mean, these are, these are uh, the kind of words that in New Zealand, which is a free trader nation, uh, that many of us uh, would applaud. How does, um, you've talked about how China is at an inflection point where uh, it should use domestic reforms to open up yeah. and also utilize the market more. How practically should China do that? What sort of domestic reforms? I think China has already announced several further steps toward like in-depth in, in reform uh, recently, uh, including uh, the reform for, of FOE, inform and uh, capital market, and uh, inform on the land system, everything. Uh, but uh, we, of course, uh, reform is also something not only announcement mainly about the action. So we have been paying more attention on the real reality, the real world, what they have done. What's the working on that? You've also talked about China uh, being open to joining CPTPP. And uh, New Zealand, of course, was one of the original uh, signatories to, uh, including with the United States, uh, to uh, starting uh, the TPP process. Um, I wonder in these days of uh, more geopolitical tension between China and the United States, how easy it would be for China to actually move towards joining CPTPP? Uh, before that, I want to add some point toward the, the one you just mentioned about the reform measures. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the, the protection of the private sector is very important, encourage private business, and also China just has passed the, uh, what do we call for the civil laws, like that, very important, and also announced about the private sector uh, with the public sector, uh, with the state-owned sector, altogether be uh, for the country for forever. I mean, among the first, early stage and also mid stage of the socialism. That means it will be forever, not only in the early stage. That is very important. Uh, let me come to the CPTPP. I think, I think China is, uh, there was a discussion, should China join the CPTPP or not? And, uh, but uh, it didn't mention, it was mentioned officially in the, past, in the old days, but it has, it has right, been taken by our leader right now, I think that is a very serious step. And I believe they're going to work on that. And I think there have been a lot of research on what difficulties we're facing for joining that. But the number one is the political wellness. I think they have hold already. Uh, let's see what they're going to do. Uh, with, if you talk about uh, uh, 
New Zealand, the role of New Zealand, I have to say that uh, our the relationship between our two countries are great. Uh, but the New Zealand has also faced a lot of challenges because you are in a, not only with China, how can I say, how can I press it? I'm sorry, let them think of that. There are indeed intentions and frictions between China and the United States and China and Australia. Mm -hmm. So this uh, country, New Zealand, has strong ties with or also. So it's a challenge for, for New Zealand, I think. But Chinese officials uh, have reiterated many times that China wouldn't ask country to choose sides. And it's in China's own interest to keep the communication open and strong with New Zealand. I think New Zealand is the first developed country to recognize China as a market economy, to have FTA with China, to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and to sign the Belt and Road Collaboration. This is also telling evidence that the bilateral ties are strong, resilient, and forward-looking. Also, it's important to never overlook the strong foundation behind any liberal ties, economic relations. That's why the audience here, the business community, has its biggest role to play. Well put. Um, just, so just talking about that tension, global tension between the United States and China, which I think, um, what's your view of how New Zealand navigates that and how potentially when points of friction occur, New Zealand can work with both parties and preserve relationships, yet move forward on ensuring a greater regional engagement for everyone. As I mentioned, the Chinese uh, officials have reiterated also, China doesn't want New Zealand to choose sides, to take sides. Also, it's, uh, it's all China's only interest to keep, I think keep communication open and strong with New Zealand is fine. There are points of contention also regionally, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Australia and China, yeah. Huawei. Uh, it's um, quite a cluttered space at the moment and uh, it requires, uh, I guess, um, skilled efforts by our diplomats and politicians. How much room does China leave New Zealand to move? I think China is very determined. There's two directions for China to choose. Where is close this door and only do everything based on itself or open its door towards the world. I think China is thinking, it's choosing the second, the, 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 I think it's the best. So that, I think New Zealand could find the opportunities there. We mm -hmm. can, we are going to find it. Um, just more broadly, um, and you can edit this, uh, is there any other thoughts you want to get across? I think, yeah, I just hope that uh, we can work well and uh, working together to have China to further grow the world and to have the CPTPP going fast. So just before we wrap, uh, can I just ask you personally, when you came to uh, New Zealand before and what part of New Zealand did you visit and what did you like about it? Actually, I wrote a series of articles on that. Uh, I was so impressive about the efficiency uh, the the passionate, also the beautiful views, landscapes, New Zealand home. Uh, Hu Shu Lai, thank you very much uh, for joining us today at the summit. We do so much hope that you can join us in person and that during this time of COVID, we all manage to get through these times successfully. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that when the summit was originally planned, we had hoped uh, to have Hu Shili here in person, but regardless, it was great to, to get those insights from her. Um, I'd just like uh, to ask Michael Barnett uh, to the stage uh, for a couple of questions uh, following that address. Thanks, Michael. Um, I wanted to ask, we, we heard um, in that address that China should be open to, to joining the CPTPP, and she said that China holds a positive and open attitude towards joining. 
What's your view on what that might mean for New Zealand business if the Trade Pact is enlarged? I think it's um, interesting because China has sort of gone through a stage of um, being suspicious about that Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, to some of the statements from Premier Li, uh, more recently appearing to be more open-minded. Um, I think the minister this morning when I posed the question to him, um, there are two things that he agreed, and that was that if they did join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that it would accelerate reforms, and accelerate reforms for China, bringing them up to similar levels as the other partners uh, in the agreement. Um, and it would also grow the agreement um, and the economic agreement uh, for all uh, of the participants. So I think you could look at that and uh, see it as a positive. I, I also look at it, and um, I think there's people in the room that would have a better perception of this, but to me it would confirm China as a superpower for trade, and that could be seen to be a bit of a slap in the face uh, for one or two other economies. Um, I think, as, as the uh, interview showed, there's going to be some hurdles to jump, um, and I think you only need to think of the issues between Japan Australia and the US. But again, Premier Lee, signalling, knows what the friction is, um, probably in the process of attracting friends, doing it well. Mm. It'd be a, it's going to be an interesting time to navigate. Um, the other thing that we have heard a couple of times today is that the attitude from China towards New Zealand has been bolstered uh, by the successful measures that were taken uh, by, by our country um, to contain the virus. Clearly, this is a sweet spot that we want to hold on to. Uh, how can le business leverage that? Yeah, it was interesting because I think the ambassador this morning told that similar story and we heard it here. Um, it almost uh, portrays us as kindred spirits and going through the same steps and the same focus. Um, but I think irrespective of whether it's New Zealand or China, um, it is about moving towards those open borders and not going back to just business as usual um, but going back to the new opportunities that are coming um, out of this um, out of this crisis, mm. and I think that's been conveyed again this morning. Mm, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for joining me on the stage. Um, I would now like to invite ANZ's Mark Hiddleston to the stage, along with his panel: Charles Finney, Jade Gray, and David Courtney. They will be discussing the strategies being used by companies to keep exports flowing uh, in the current time, where direct links are still marginal. Thanks very much, Mark.